Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the JCO article, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy and Advanced Prostate Cancer, a Randomized Controlled Trial by Suzanne K. Chambers et al. My name is Linda Carlson, and I'm a full professor in oncology and psychology at the University of Calgary, Cummings School of Medicine in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. My oncologic specialty is psychosocial and integrative oncology. I was pleased to see this study looking at the use of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for men with advanced prostate cancer, as it is one of the first to look at the applicability of these types of interventions in this specific patient population. To put it in context, most of the research on what we collectively call mindfulness-based interventions, or MBIs, has been conducted on women with breast cancer and mixed groups of cancer patients and survivors. The research on MBIs in breast cancer patients is quite abundant and strongly supports their use, for improving overall quality of life, stress levels, anxiety, depressive symptoms, cancer-related symptoms, and a myriad of other outcomes, including post-traumatic growth and spirituality. Several meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials and review papers have found medium effect sizes across psychological outcomes in this body of work. So given the bulk of work already out there, what does this paper add to our knowledge of MBIs for people with cancer diagnoses? Well, first of all, the participants didn't benefit from the intervention in the way the authors anticipated. In fact, they didn't benefit at all, at least on the measures assessed. This suggests that perhaps MBIs are not for everyone, as some researchers and proponents of these interventions may attest. As one of these admitted proponents, at least within the confines of what the literature tells us, at first I wanted to figure out what they did wrong. Was the study underpowered? Were the measures inadequate? Maybe the men were doing okay in the first place and didn't need support. Maybe the intervention wasn't delivered properly. That was certainly possible as they were attempting to deliver what had always been a group face-to-face program to a group over the phone. Quite a different animal in my view and difficult to pull off, I imagine. But as it turns out, most of these issues had been carefully considered and addressed by the authors. They had done pilot work with the adapted telephone intervention in this patient population and found preliminary benefit. They had well-trained facilitators and carefully addressed treatment fidelity. The study was powered to detect medium to large effects on the outcomes and allowed for 30% attrition. So it could be argued that by the time all was said and done, there were some issues with being underpowered. But I don't think these accounted for the lack of effects reported. I do think one of the issues that may help to account for the lack of effect could be that the men were not overly distressed to begin with. This may seem an unlikely possibility given that the men were facing incurable cancer, but as it turned out, only about 40% reported scores for distress above the clinical cutoffs on the BSI measure. Given that the BSI was also one of their primary outcomes, it's not surprising that there wasn't much quote-unquote room to improve in this sample. That's what we call a floor effect. For many, their scores on distress were already low, so there wasn't much room to decrease further on the measure before hitting the zero mark. So perhaps including only those with current difficulties would have shown more benefits on these outcomes. Along these lines, I always wonder why researchers who do psychosocial trials targeting problems like distress or anxiety don't include only people who have significant distress or anxiety in the first place. You would never try to treat a condition like hypertension, for example, in a sample of patients without hypertension at the outset. So why do it for psychological outcomes? In this case, I believe the authors chose not to do this as they may have felt offering the programs only to more distressed men in this population would be somehow unethical. I differ in that regard as I don't think it's useful to offer programs to people who do not seem to need them, or in fact even want them, as in this case. This brings me to the next point, the low level of uptake of the program and high rates of dropouts. Over half of the men identified as eligible, 54%, that's 221 out of 411 approached, 
they were not interested in the program at all. Of 94 men who were interested and assigned to the MBCT groups, 26 didn't attend any sessions, and 19 attended only one to three of the possible eight sessions. So in sum, only half the sample, that's 49 out of 94 men, even got an appropriate dose of the intervention. This is a major limitation in the analysis but more importantly speaks to the desirability or appropriateness of this intervention for men with advanced prostate cancer. They were voting with their feet, so to speak. While it makes the study underpowered and difficult to interpret, the simple fact that only half of the men recruited to the study actually attended the groups speaks louder than the statistics. And these 49 men made up only 12% of all those initially approached. Also convincing of a lack of effect is the per-protocol analysis on those men who did get a sufficient dose, where even that group didn't show any substantial benefit. So it seems unequivocal to me that this intervention was just not a good fit for this population. So what conclusions can we draw about MBIs for people with cancer from this study? As we know, one study never stands alone. So added to the larger body of research on MBIs for cancer patients and survivors, what can we say? I think we know there is benefit for women with breast cancer. But what about other types of cancer survivors, including older people and men? These participants were not only male, unlike most participants in previous studies of MBIs, but they were also an older cohort. Perhaps the format on the phone had something to do with the less acceptable nature of the program. Perhaps it didn't appeal to their masculinity. And what do we know from a research perspective about MBIs for patients currently on treatment and those with advanced disease? Not much, as it turns out. So the conclusions are those that typically end every research paper. We have more questions than answers. We need more studies. Indeed, I think, if anything, this study serves as a cautionary tale to researchers and clinicians alike, not to jump on the mindfulness bandwagon without thought to the variable demographics and needs of the people we seek to serve. The field needs more carefully designed and executed trials like this one to move our understanding forward and help shape the next round of more sophisticated and nuanced research. This concludes this JCO podcast. Thank you for listening. For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.